So this is the second week of Lent. And as you know, I'm fasting instant gratification this season. So I, my son comes to me this week and says, Dad, this kid is a sugar junkie. And he comes to me and goes, can you make me some strawberry milk? He calls it pink milk. And he goes, can you make me some? And I said, in my heart, in my, no, I can't have that, you know? And um, he's like, please, can you make me some pink milk? And I'm like, all right. And I, you know, he brings actually the milk and the, the strawberry syrup, puts it on the kitchen table and says, go ahead, make it. And then I start pouring that Hershey strawberry syrup on the cup and it, start, it starts to overspill to, to the table. I put milk in it. And I have to be honest with you folks, when that spilled over, I licked some <laughs> with my fingers. And um, I didn't preserve any shred of dignity in that moment. It, it was just gone. But, but uh, you know, all joking aside, honestly to tell you, in my own experience, fasting has actually been pretty easy for me. It's getting easier. You're like, well, how? I th- well, for example, I think the fasting part of Instant gratification for me, fasting, you know, the mobility and the preference to choose whatever I want, when I want. And so many choices, it's freed me up and set me free. But like, really? Set you free from what? From choices. Like when people ask, people when ask me, you know, what do you want to eat? I go, I don't have a preference. You know, just this weekend, I was in, in the city. We took Nathan to Build-A-Bear where they had a play date, a birthday party. And my wife said, would you drive us there on Saturday? And I go, usually Saturdays are my days to meditate, to stay away from everyone. And people, I'm, an, I'm a high I. I like my time to meditate on God's word. And, you know. But when she said, can you take us? And I was like, you know, for the first time in a long time, I actually had the energy. I said, you know what? Sure. And I was like, wow, because I'm not spending so much time on choosing things that don't really matter, right? Because think about this. How much time do we spend on frivolous matters? Like, what do I eat? I mean, for example, you're on Netflix. I'm sorry for those who can't watch. And, you know, you're on Netflix and there are 50 billion movies on. And sometimes I feel tired. And for my family, it takes about two hours and we don't end up watching a movie. They go, okay, next time. Because we're scrolling through every single one and we can't. I mean, how much time is spent on things that don't matter at all? And then when decisions come, the choices you have to make that really matter, like jobs, schools, you don't even want to make those decisions, right? You saw in your own life, when you got that admission letter from whatever school you wanted to go to, you wouldn't want to open it. You go here. You ask your mom, you ask your friend to open it, and you cringe. You don't even want to make those decisions. The truth is, we don't want to be so much in control as we think we do. You just think having the option is a good thing, but it's not. For me, I'm freed up to go wherever. And not just finding the grind of things. And, you know, I felt it really freeing my life up. And it felt really good. And guess what happened? So we were at, you know, the play date this Saturday. And then I meet up Peeps, Pastor Billy. And he's like, what do you want to eat? And I go, I don't have a preference. You choose. The burden is on you. He goes, I I go, whatever you want. Poka, let's go. I'm like, this is great. I was at Poka eating lovely chicken, enjoying the moment. And then afterwards, I said, do you want to go for dessert? And Pastor Billy was being a Pharisee. He was like, you can't have dessert. You hypocrite. We're, we're leading Lent. I'm like, I'm fasting instant gratification. It's the preference to choose a dessert. Not the fact that I can't have dessert. And he's like, okay, all right, well, where should we go? And I go, whatever you want. It, it felt so good. Like, I don't care. I can't choose anyway. And then he gets tea. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> he gets tea and cookies. And he pours some and we sit in the car and just talk about life. And it was like a bromantic time. 
It was a beautiful moment. It, it just carried me there, you know? It gives me energy to not really focus on the frivolousness of life. It makes me and slows me down and makes me enjoy the people around me, be attentive to what's going on, because now I'm really aligned, perhaps, to something that really matters. And what I want to talk about today, as we focus on this passage, let's go there, is how do we free ourselves from things that are frivolous, frivolous worry, to engaging in things that really matter, that have eternal impact, eternal significance. Well, I think we can learn a couple of lessons from this passage. Well, I'm going to read this in the life of Jesus, okay? Let me read this passage for you first, John 5, and I want you to read it all with me together. Verse 19, what does Jesus say? Jesus gave them what? This answer. What does he say? I tell you the truth, the son can do what? Nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. Now, pay attention to what Jesus says. If you want to study someone's life, that's the most effective. In everything that he has done is Jesus. If you want to look at the model of leadership, you look at Jesus because he was the most successful in his mission. If you want to look at healthy relationships, you want to look at the model of Jesus because he loved and cared for people so much. People remember him and love him. And it's 2,000 years later. If you want to really take the model of why Jesus was able to accomplish so much in life and at the same time have such quality relationships, this is the key. Jesus was also freed up because he wasn't just fasting 40 days. He was fasting his own, what, preference, his own mobility. He was what? He says, I tell you the truth. The son could do nothing by himself. He can do only what, what? What's he say? What he, what? Sees his father doing. You see, he didn't focus so much on his will like we do, right? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want to watch? What I, what, what I don't want to watch. He focused on what? What the Father was doing. So go to this passage here. And this is what Paul says. And this is our chapter for today. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2 quickly and try to focus on what God is trying to say. Okay, so let's read here. It says in verse 12, in ver- chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore... I urge you, what, brothers, in the view of what? God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, what? His pleasing and perfect will. So, This is what Paul says. He says, first, the word therefore, meaning he's arguing for why you might want to. Tell someone might want to. Tell someone it's a suggestion. Let me tell you right now, because there's a difference between a suggestion and an assertion. Assertion in the Bible are commandments. They're not negotiable. They're not something that you can say, well, I think I'll do it, or it's a preference. And that's why Paul here doesn't say, I, the Lord commands, or the Ten Commandments say, I don't assert. Paul says, I urge. The word uses the word urge. And therefore, is always an argument. He goes, he, for the first 12 chapters of Romans, Paul was outlining the life and the power found in Jesus. And how Jesus modeled the new humanity in Jesus following God and how that kind of life trickles down when you surrender your will to God. And therefore he says, after seeing the model of Jesus, I want to urge you brothers in the view of God's mercy. And what's that word? It says what? To what? To offer. 
It's a suggestion. Let me tell you right now, no one could force you to live for God's will. It doesn't matter how many times your leaders or your parents or your friends tell you, why don't you live for your destiny that God has for your life? It sounds nice, but doesn't mean you're going to choose that. This part of the passage is focusing on the issue of control. This is a part that we do have. This is the sphere of influence in our own life. We are the kings of our own life in that sense where we choose God's will or not. God can't force us and no one can force us. It's very important to differentiate that part of this text or you'll never really understand it. Oh yeah, I should offer my body. I should live a life of worship. I should do God's will. No, it doesn't work that way. You're going to have to want to do it. Because it's not a real sacrifice if you don't want to and you just do it to follow the emotions. A lot of people do spiritual things because they want approval. They want to meet the obligation. But the real transformative part always comes when you choose for yourself. And this is what he says. The question is, why sacrifice? How many people here like sacrificing? People are like, no, not me, not me, not me. I don't like sacrificing. I hate it. it, it and we, we talked about this theme, this motif last week. A lot of people think, oh, oh yeah, deny yourself, fast. This is the whole season is about fasting, this Lent thing. No, we said it, you don't fast to fast. You don't deny to deny. You deny to what? Feast. Here, Paul is arguing the, the same pattern or motif, but just about the will, about purpose, about destiny. He's saying fast your preference and mobility of your your, basically, your control to choose what you want to do for something better. Because what? If you read verse 2, after the renewing of your mind, what's the next word? I want you to read it to me out loud. What does it say? Okay, not three people. One, two, three. Say the word. Then. A lot of Christians come to me and say, I don't know the will of God. Really? Read, read, first, read Romans 12. I, I, I pray, I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand it. What's the will of God for me? Does he want me to be a fashion designer? Does he want me to be a banker? Does he? No. Something comes before all those occupations and what you do to pay the bills, to use your gifts. God says, when you sacrifice your mobility, your preference, and say, God, I want to. I don't know what it is even, but I say yes to what you have for my life, what you've envisioned. Then the text says, then you will be able to test what? And approve God's will. What God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect. Then you agree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have an issue, I had, had this issue since my birth. You know, um, I would go try on clothes, especially pants. And one thing always gets in the way of size, sizes. Everything fits, per I mean, how people like, you know, go getting a pair of jeans and everything fits you perfectly. You know, the length, you know, the width, everything. But sometimes... My buttocks doesn't fit quite well, you know? And, and I remember this in, um, you know, in, in, in college. And I'm just, you know, I was a size 31. And I would wear size 31 pants and it, everything would look great until you look behind me. You know, people used to call it the Jennifer Lopez curse I had. And, and um, it, you know, my people may think that's a good or a bad thing. But, you know, my butt would really get in the way. And I just, I'd be like, I'm like, you know, and, and um, I've learned to embrace it. God's blessed me, you know what I'm saying? Too much maybe. And, <laughs> but in that kind of hyperbolic picture, that, that form of exaggeration, you, you know, a lot of times why we're so confused, why things are so foggy in our life, literally is that our butt gets in the way. 
It does. Our will, our frivolousness of choosing this and that, worrying about nothing, and worrying about the big things. And we spend most of our times unwinding the mess of our choices that we never get to God's will. You see, Jesus in, in Romans 12 is really a picture of Jesus. Jesus did spent, he didn't spend any time on what do I want? What, what should I get? Because his whole mission in life was about, okay, Father, you're smarter than I. What should we do? And he did it. And the impact and the relationships and the world changed. That's the power of surrendering your life to God's will. You know, seven habits of the most effective people since 1990, it's been one of the most best-selling business books and success books in history. McCoy talks about these issues and he says this. He says, most effective people are not people that focus 90% of their life on problems, putting out fires. How many people here, do you spend most of your time unwinding from crisis? This problem with this person, running away from that, this problem here. And why did you get in that problem in the first place? Probably because you probably shouldn't have done that in the first place. And a lot of times we focus on problems, putting out fires, because we keep making them. And a whole life becomes about what we don't want to do. And our energy is drained by that. You see, he, McCoy also mentions this, that the most effective people focus on their calling. Focused on what they're good at. If you want to translate that to the life of Jesus, Jesus focused his whole being on the will of God. So today, how do you stop frivolous worry and start engaging in things that matter, really matter? Well, first lesson we learn from this text is what? Everyone say it to your neighbor, fast your what? Will to what? Feast on God's will. People are like, oh, okay. But I like my will. Let me just say, the Bible is making it very clear that whatever our will is, whatever our pseudo narrative is, the ultimate story of God has written for us, it's much greater and better. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> that your life is going to be perfect because you choose God's will. You know, the most feared occupation in the church. Do you know what that is? It's number one on the list. Guess what it is? Missionary. How many people here want to be a missionary? People are like, no, I'll take pastor, no missionary. I mean, what would you prefer? Okay, let me, let me give you two poisonous pills. Would you rather be a pastor or a missionary? <laughs> You're like, uh, I, neither. Because a lot of times when people hear the word missionary, it's about complete abandonment of things and just going to the Amazon jungle without clothes. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, that I'm, I can't have my Diet Coke. Well, that's what my fear was. And, um, you know, I, I can't have this and then you won't have any mobility at all. And people fear that part. And then you have to start thinking about this then as people that believe in God. Let's go down. I want to focus on this because the church in the world, if, they, if, if Christians fear a mission, being a missionary, when the truth is Jesus already called all of us to be missionaries. There's no special calling to be a missionary. We're all called to be missionaries. We're all supposed to tell people about Christ. But why, why is that resistance there? Well, because verse 2 talks about it we have these values that we're shaped by. And our values are shaped by our culture more than the kingdom of God. Right? It says in verse two, read it with me. I, I underlined the words that are important. It says what? Do not conform any longer what? To the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Do not conform, Paul says, any longer to the pattern of this world. What, what does he mean by that? He's talking about Imago YouTube, Imago Prada, Imago Gucci, Imago Lacoste. That's one of my problems. You know, Imago Ralph Lauren. Because what you're shaped by is media, an image of what is excellent and what is good. So people spent most of their lives trying to acquire these brands, these names, so that what? That those things are the most valued in life. Here, Paul is talking about Imago Dei, the image of God, the beauty of God. And those values crash and conflict all the time. Like, for example, I spoke at Nyack Chapel this Friday. And, you know, when I met my wife, I knew that she played piano. I just didn't know how good she was. But I was kind of offended coming out of chapel. You know, because when I usually come out of chapel, people are lining up. You know, oh, yeah, you know, you did well. And I'm like, okay, okay, stop bothering me. But this time, there was some of that inside. But when I was coming out, a person approached me. And I said, I don't have time for autograph. I'm sorry. No, I'm kidding. I, I didn't feel like that. But, you know, it was like she came to me and said, did your wife leave? I'm like, what? Because, you know, Pastor Lydia came and she did the ministry time. She goes, where's your wife? I'm like, I'm here. She's like, where's your wife? I think she went to the car. And he goes, your wife. And her playing is so anointed by God. I, I never felt the presence of God like that. I'm like, I just preached the sermon too. <laughs> and she was like, wow. Wow, Pastor Sam, you have a jewel. You have a jewel given. You, you are so blessed. And I'm like, well, I want to hear you're blessed by me. And she, you're so blessed to have such a jewel. I'm like, whatever. But, you know, the first time, you know, I actually really understood, um, I had no idea the narrative of, of my wife's story with music, but I've learned later as I got to know her better that, you know, at the age of five and four, she just got up one day in the piano and just started playing by ear what she heard on the commercials. And then when, I, when, I, when I found that she had perfect pitch, it annoyed me and could play by ear. It's just, you know, it's just like, come on. He goes, you don't have to read it. You don't have to work. No, nope, I just do it. <laughs> like, whatever, right? And, and when she came to night, I, I had no idea that she came on a scholarship on music. And the, I remember the highlight of her music day was when she was a music major and she did a concerto, I believe on Bach. And, and it was a beautiful recital. People brought flowers. A lot of people there are listening to this. But you know, I remember when God, she told me that God called her, you know, and her professor said, you know, what are you doing in Nyack? You should, you should go pursue music professionally. You should go to Juilliard. You should go, you should enhance this gift that you have. And she says to them, no. They go, why not? You're so gifted. You're so talented. I don't care. Well, what do you want to do? I want to, I want to be a youth pastor. I just want to love kids for Jesus. I love God. And they're like, so you could do both. She's like, no. I feel called to minister to a youth audience and tell them about God. I don't care about the music stuff. You see, when, when she said that to people, and this is, now you know why, I was like, wow, that's hot. <laughs> I was like, now that's Proverbs 31 right there. That's, that's hot. Because for her, she was, she, she even though, had, if, and, and really this is true for a lot of people with giftedness, a lot of people with giftedness use the gifts to manipulate and leverage it for their own glory because the world says that's how you attain celebrity because that's what's valued by our culture. For her, though she could, she loved God's will. And the truth is that's that. Really, that part, her giving up that, was part of how we have this vision of reaching the lost of our generation. 
And you know what? That's what I fell in love with. Because the values of God's beauty and God's glory was so much bigger than the ambition and the approval of the world. And let me just tell you, that's not a calling just for her. It's a calling for us in this text. It is a calling for all of us. The question of how, what do we really value? I pray the Holy Spirit today would examine, help us examine this reality, this tension of we believe in a founder, Jesus, that gave up his life willingly, the Bible says, and took upon the will of the Father to change the world, to heal the world. What are we shaped by? What do we really value? Because in the end of the day, what you value is what you worship. Because worship is not just a song. It's ultimately what do we hold in the deepest honor. And that's why we sacrifice. So, how do you stop engaging in frivolous worry and really engage in things that really matter? Eternal significance. Well, we learn, secondly, if we want to do this, you have to what? Fast what? The beauty. Fast on the beauty of the world to feast on what? The beauty of God. And I think today, as we come before God, as through this Lent season, for those of us fasting, the media especially, fasting celebrity gossip, you're like, oh, I want to know who, how many kids Brad and Angelina adopted today. Please, why does that matter? They're probably going to adopt one every month. And, and you get so focused on, I mean, the, the stupidity of celebrity and sports. And, and I know, me too, I, I fall into that. Michael Jordan conversation was a bad thing, the 50 thing. And, you know, and we fall into the trap of what is nothing that will fade away. And we miss the fountain and the beauty of God, of his plan for our life. Because we value, our value system is screwed up. And that's why God says we need to renew our mind in him. We need to see a revelation of the beauty of God and the beauty of his calling for our lives. So, will you stand with me as we pray? Will you lift your hands to the Lord with me? Folks, I sense in the spirit today that God wants to do something pretty deep within us. The image of God, Imago Dei, and all the beauty around us is a reflection, a glimpse of the beauty of God. <laughs> Art is not created, it's discovered. Music is not written, it's found. Poetry is caught. We can only be inspired by what is around us, what we can taste and what we can experience. Today, I pray whatever image becomes our God, and it doesn't matter how much we say money is not our God, fame is not our God, celebrity is not our God, 
The truth is what we value most is God. I want to pray, Lord, today. And I know that this is a grind in the spirit because I feel it. We are so influenced. We are so conformed. Our value system, God, is so conformed to the patterns of this world and the beauty of this world that it's hard for us to change gears even. And there's a struggle. As you lift your hands to God, will you ask for the Spirit of God to show you, to free you up, to stop obsessing about the beauty of creation and start obsessing on the beauty of the Creator? Because what you love really is just a glimpse of the Creator. Right now, folks, you need to engage the darkness of our own soul. Now, there's going to be awkwardness. There's going to be discomfort. Because our God is what we value most. Father, I want to pray in behalf of our church and our community. God, we repent today. For whatever beauty and for whatever thing that is created or we create that exceeds you, the creator. And Father, we're so obsessed with images the imago day of certain something that we are driven by to become or to do or to acquire. I pray today, God, that the vision of the beauty of Jesus in his will and who he is would overtake us, would start changing our taste. And I pray, God, whatever we make in our life, in our relationships, in our jobs, we would reflect the beauty of God by glorifying Him. Let's, let's sing, turn our eyes upon Jesus as two-liner Him and make it simple. I want to pray right now that the Spirit of God would come and in this Lent season, as we fast, imago whatever, we would see the true beauty of Imago Dei and be transformed. And as Paul says, live a spiritual act of worship by offering our heart and our life to the creator for his glory. I sing this together. Let's make this our prayer. Upon Jesus Turn your eyes. 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look forward to his wonderful face. And the things of earth. And the things of earth. Will grow strangely dim. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look forward to His wonderful face. And the things of earth. And the things of earth will grow strange. So, Father, we want to come before you this afternoon. And reflect on the words, God, of this beautiful hymn. You know, the hymn writer that wrote this song was trying to write a song for a long time and eventually got these two lines. And people were like, well, when are you going to finish the song? And as she prayed about it, she realized that the song was finished. Because that's all we have to say to God today. It's not the fasting that's going to change our life. It's what the fasting gives us access to. We fast worldly pleasure, worldly beauty to feast on the beauty of God and the, and the feast on the person of Christ. And then we are changed. I pray that Lent would become a season where God becomes so beautiful that everything around us becomes dull. Bow your heads for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's people say amen. God bless you. We'll see you very soon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church, and I just want to welcome you to our Sunday service. It's our first service in Lent, and uh, we're celebrating Lent this year. We're celebrating it because it is the time when we celebrate, you know, Christ coming, sacrificing everything that he had, you know, everything he had in heaven to live as one of us, to die for our sins. So we just want to invite you all to uh, celebrate Lent with, with us. Uh, all of us here are sacrificing something. We're picking something up. Uh, we're sacrificing so that we can remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And I just want to encourage you to celebrate Lent with us in that way. Uh, we have a couple of announcements before we get started. We're going to start out with prayer requests. Uh, we have our prayer request line, 5397 prayer, where we send our pr uh, texts. When we have things going on in our lives that we need God to work, and when we send a prayer saying, God, I need you to work in this area of my life, and we pray for those things because there is power in prayer. God really does answer prayer, and a lot of people have sent a lot of prayers in and had a lot of answers from God in these things. So I just want to encourage you to send them. And again, when you, uh, when you have God move in your life, you can send a uh, praise as well so that we can all celebrate what God is doing in your life. Next, we have tithes and offerings. You know, we find it very important to continue God's mission on this earth. And one of those ways that we do that, and we also do this to keep God in the center of our lives, is by tithing. So if you're a member here at 180 Church, I just want to encourage you to remember to tithe faithfully. You can tithe either at the info booth in the back. You can tithe online at 180church.tv through PayPal. Or you can go through Chase QuickPay at offering at 180church.tv. 
Our next announcement is about small groups. Small groups are where we get together, where we talk more in depth about what God is doing in our lives, uh, how he's reaching out to us, how he's speaking to our lives. And it's a great way to get better plugged into the rest of the community and see that we all go through very similar things. We're all on this walk uh, in Christ together, and we can really draw strength from that, you know, from being together as a group, as a community who goes through these things together. So if you're not in a small group, I want to really encourage you to join one. We have ones that meet in uh, the city as well as in Staten Island all through the week. And uh, just talk to Andrew Park, and he'll be able to get you plugged into one. Our last announcement is about sharing the gospel. You know, we send out our uh, email every week with Pastor Sam's sermon from Sunday. And at the bottom of that email, we have a link where you can plug in the email address of a friend of yours so that they can get the sermon as well, so that you can get them started on the journey with Christ. Because we all want our brothers and our sisters to finish with us, you know, to... Um, to find Christ, to have a full life in him. So this is a real easy way to do that. And we are also on Facebook, and you can share the sermons there as well. And it's just a really good way, good, easy way to just share the sermons, share the uh, work that God is doing, share um, what God wants to do in your friends' lives. Precious in his eyes Because of his great love He gave his only son Everything was done So you would come There's nothing you can do There's nothing you can do To make him love you more there's nothing that you've done Could make him close the 